Hi, everyone. We have the last keynote of the event now, uh, which is very exciting. Georg Nortov is here with us. Uh, he's a professor at the University of Ottawa Institute of Mental Health Research. He's a trained neuroscientist, psychiatrist, and a philosopher with separate degrees in all three. And uh, his area of research is the connection between brain and mind and the exchanges uh, of those with uh, psychiatric disorders. And we're very happy to have you here today talking about your temporospatial theory of consciousness. So the stage is yours and welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. And by the way, exciting program with all these different series of consciousness. And you will see at the end of my talk, I will try to include and refer to that. So you already see the uh, the way I set it up, the question um, in the title of my talk, what is the common currency of brain and mind, that, that I look for similarities. And that, I think, really is a key feature of the temporal spatial theory of consciousness. So for me, it's really the question, how does neuronal activity transform into mental activity? Yeah, And you see here, I have the uh, Frankenstein by the way, highly recommended to look up the movie on YouTube. Very interesting movie, placed somewhere in Romania. Uh, and uh, and I added, you see, how is this, this is the gray matter, gray uh, gruesome device? I added the gruesome gray pipe device, comes from Arthur Schopenhauer, philosopher in 19th century. So how is that possible? Because we cannot observe it in the brain image. So my talk will first very briefly present, very uh, briefly prevent a uh, the background theory, the assumption of, as I said, non-specialness and common currency to uh, provide a little bit more flesh uh, to the bones in these concepts. And then I will go right, I show you some, the mechanism and some empirical support. And one key feature, I think, which really distinguishes the DTC from other uh, consciousness theories is that it assumes different kinds of mechanisms, different dimensions of consciousness, different mechanisms. So here you see for the level state of consciousness, we assume temporal spatial nestedness. I'll explain all that later. Then later form structure of consciousness as the unique feature of the TTC, the form of consciousness, uh, temporal spatial alignment, and then the content of consciousness. So let me uh, briefly start with the background assumption. As you know, uh, neuroscience is always dependent upon the kind of theoretical models. Uh, the, your model dis, uh, drives the kind of science you do and what you can perceive and what you don't perceive in your experimental designs and in your data. So here I sketch what I see, what I call the argument of specialness in the current debate of consciousness in both philosophy of mind and neuroscience. Uh, there's always a consciousness is something special. And that is distinguished from non-consciousness. So there is an essential difference. Obviously, historically, that goes back to the dualism of Descartes. And now, of course, we say we know better. Of course, we know that the mind is the brain. But, however, we still say the mental features, there are certain specific features in the brain's neuronal activity as distinguished from others. Specific regions, specific mechanisms, specific frequencies. Um, and... That what we assume, and that is different from the rest of the brain. And you see, I uh, okay. like to see it in philosophy, uh, you have the difference between reflective phenomenal, net block axis versus phenomenal consciousness. And in neuroscience, you can say, let's say, of course, maybe here, uh, it's a very uh, uh, a gross, uh, coarse overview. So please don't pin me down that I associated here the global neuronal workspace with access consciousness, IIT with phenomenal. And you see, that's really principally different. So, and I think most of the uh, 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 neuroscientific theories of consciousness, which we summarized in this uh, 2020 paper, uh, it's really trying to embed and integrate a special neuronal mechanism, basically on top of the otherwise completely non-special brain. Yeah, so there's a special mechanism and a non-special mechanism, and the special mechanism is consciousness. And you can really see this, I don't can go, cannot go into detail about that, but you can really see it in most of the series. So the idea is the TTC has exactly the opposite. We replace difference by similarity. What is shared between neuronal and mental features? Because that you need to know in order to see how neuronal activity transforms into mental activity. For instance, we all, we all come from different countries, as I see. 
And if you weren't speaking German, uh, sorry, uh, that's a Freudian slip here, uh, because I'm from Germany originally. So sorry, if you weren't speaking English, uh, you would not understand. We could not communicate. We wouldn't share a language. Let's say if I were starting German, of course, I assume that nobody of you speaks German, you would say, what is this guy talking about? We have no idea. And there would be no exchange possible. That's exactly what I'm looking. I'm looking for something, how neuronal and mental features share. And that is basically the prelude then to address the question, how can neuronal activity transform into mental activity? So we're looking for similarity between neuronal and mental levels. So now, of course, the next thing you say, yeah, please tell me what is the similarity? What is the common currency? So and here, this is again where I go really back to most basic features in nature, not just in the brain, in nature. So I go back to the dynamics, and this is a beautiful quote. I always love this here the, uh, uh, by Nikola Tesla. Again, look, look him up on the on the website. He's an engineer, 19th, 20th century, and he's probably as brilliant, as probably as eccentric as the Tesla, uh, as um, Elon Musk. But it's really interesting. Um, so, and he had this beautiful quote, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, vibration. And that's exactly what I'm doing. I say, okay, it's the brain dynamic, but it's not only the brain dynamic, it's also the mental dynamic. So I consider the, the uh, consciousness and mental features primarily an energetic frequency and vibration phenomenon following Tesla. And you will see, I put a lot of empirical flesh to the bones in the following by recruiting various measures from uh, signal processing, engineering, and physics. That's what we fleshed out in this paper 2020. And that's what I mean by common currents. So a little bit more empirical, what do you mean by spatial temporal features here? It's a topography. Topography means not just one region, but how the single region in the brain relates to all other regions in the brain. So our approach is an explicitly whole brain approach. And temporal dynamic is different frequencies, different ways I will uh, call it. And now I will try to show you that that really these features of the brain, you can see them in the mental side as well as on the neuronal side. And I will show you some support for that. So this is basically the uh, TTC, uh, some of the papers about the TTC which we published, but two things which I think are relatively unique features of the TTC compared to other theories are first, we do not consider ourselves either a task-based or resting state activity uh, uh, theory. You see, for instance, all the task-based theories were very nicely reviewed by the paper by Seth and Bain 2022 in Nature Neuroscience. But when you look at that paper, he left out all the resting state theories, like the entropy hypothesis, like the operational space-time by the Fingercourt brothers. The TTC is neither a pure resting state nor a task activity. It tries really to link, and you will see it particular in the mechanism of the temporal spatial expansion uh, as a third mechanism. And it is explicitly a neural and a neurophenomenal theory. You will see, I try to uh, decipher the neuronal mechanism and then also how these neuronal mechanisms lead to phenomenal features. So it really distinguishes so you have the neuronal mechanism and then the neurophenomenal mechanism. So that's very important and uh, sort of keep that in the back of the mind. A uh, very short overview, I already indicated that of the structure, the basic structure of the TTC, uh, as I said, uh, different dimensions of consciousness. Here you see the level states, that's normal. Then you see the contents of consciousness. Here basically they hidden under the phenomenology. The, the third column, and in between you see sort of the form uh, of consciousness. That's where you uh, really, that's the organization structure philosophically that goes back to uh, Immanuel Kant and this concept of form, structure, organization, certain topography. I hope that will become more clear uh, throughout the talk by the examples. And then we also have a, a fourth mechanism, temporal spatial globalization reporting. So I will go along these uh, particularly the first three mechanism in my talk to give you an idea how the TTC sets things up. So, and with that, I come, as I said, to the first mechanism, level state of consciousness, uh, temple spatial nestedness. And uh, <clears throat> so this is basically here. You see in this table, this is from the paper 2017, we exactly say what kind of uh, brain activity, how you can test this, what kind of temple spatial features in the brain activity 
uh, and the special neuronal mechanism. And also, or lower also, so you see what we call the neural predisposition of consciousness, very important. This is the necessary condition of possible consciousness, the necessary non-sufficient conditions of possible consciousness, meaning if you don't have those necessary conditions fulfilled in your brain activity, and you will see examples, you will not be able to develop any consciousness at all. Yeah, so this is, uh, I think, also new, which we uh, introduced in a paper 2013, then more substantiated in 2015, and you will see uh, an example of that. So this is slightly different from the neural prerequisites and the neural uh, correlates of the content of consciousness. Very important. Okay. Let me try a little bit, what do I mean by nested? So here you see now, it's basically now the, the first real application uh, um, to the, uh, remember the Tesla quote with the energy frequency vibration. So I consider the brain, I like to consider the brain in terms of waves. Uh, you see here upper left typical brain, you see a raw time series, you see there's not much order, but however, when you decompose it, of course you all know that uh, you can have different frequencies. We can have different frequencies. You have infraslow frequency, for instance, the fMRI, 0.01 hertz to 0.1 hertz, and then delta, theta, and slow cortical potentials, and so forth, uh, and then EEG image. So, and what is important that uh, you can really decompose this, and you can see there's a typical lower left, what is called a power law distribution. Some of you may know that. It's really what is typical that the slower frequencies have stronger power than the faster frequencies. Uh, you're in Israel or in Egypt, the beach is very close, and you enjoy the water. I'm sure you do, and I envy you for that. As I said, it's minus five here in Canada. So, and so there's no way to go into any water here. And so, and you have big waves. So, the small waves is no problem. The small waves, they're less spatially expanded and they're not powerful and they're fast frequency. And then you have big waves which are very powerful, and you're really afraid of them because they might smash you back to the beach. Same in the brain. The bigger waves uh, have very a lot, a lot of power. That's here in the lower left. You see a lock lock uh, characterization for power and frequency. Uh, slower frequencies have much more power than faster frequencies. So this is a basic dynamic. is also called pink noise. Um, it's a basic dynamic uh, characterization. This is not specific to the brain, nothing specific to the brain. It's all over in nature. And then you can also uh, calculate what's called in the time domain. You can uh, calculate the uh, lower right, uh, the temporal autocorrelation window, autocorrelation with the time lags, and how much basically the time series over time correlates with it itself. And these are kind of uh, dynamic uh, uh, measures. And why do I speak of nestedness? Because just like different Russian dolls, or have you seen the uh, Chinese crystal balls? Beautiful, there's uh, plenty of crystal balls, include smaller different sizes in one big crystal ball, as same in the Russian dolls. And that's exactly the relationship here between the different frequencies, the nestedness. The faster ones are nested within the slower one, and that in turn is nested within the next slower one. That's why we speak of temple special nestedness. So let me show you some uh, actual data. This is a paper from 2018, and we have another study which uh, replicated, which is in revision, come out. So what we looked here for in, in anesthesia, I don't want to show you all the detail, uh, awake versus anesthetic state, and we calculated here what is called the power law exponents. This is basically the slope of the curve, the steepness of the curve. The more steeper that curve, the more power in the slower frequencies. So, and... Now, and this is really interesting, so particularly look here lower left. This is a, quite a dramatic finding. So you see in the awake state, this is a typical power spectrum. You see a lot of power in the slow frequencies. This is fMRI, so we're in the range of 0.01 hertz to 0.1 hertz, so 100 second to 10 second cycle duration. So it's really slow compared to what we do in EEG, MEG. And you see, this is a typical shape of the power spectrum in the awake state. Yeah, so you have much more power in the slower frequencies, less power in the faster. And this is also what is described as pink noise. Then, however, look in the anesthetic state, it's completely flat. There's no differentiation. In it. What does that mean? So that means there's no difference between the different frequencies. There's no differentiation anymore. Ultimately, that means that also the input, the external inputs are all pre processed the same way. So there's no differentiation anymore um, within the brain. And that's very important for the phenomenology. I will come back to that. So here, 
Um, so this is basically, you see here, the temporal nestedness is lost. Yeah, it's not that the faster frequencies are still nested within the slower frequencies. No, it's just all the same in terms of the power. So it's a one homogeneous uh, uh, frequency. It's no longer a power. It's all the same. Uh, it's no differentiation anymore. And that's very important, I think, at this level. So next thing, here we saw about how about spatial nestedness. Spatial nestedness means if one region is uh, integrated within a network, a network is integrated, embedded, or nested within the whole uh, global brain activity. And that's what we investigated here is global brain activity. This is basically global functional connectivity because basically you look for the functional connectivity of each voxel uh, with all other voxels in the brain. It's a little bit similar to the graph theoretic measure of degree centrality. So this is global signal here. Um, and you can clearly see that you have a high degree of synchronization, high degree of global brain activity in the awake state. You see this here in wakefulness, and we did this in sleep, and in sleep you see a, a consecutive reduction uh, throughout the three sleep stages. Then uh, we did the same in anesthesia. This is, uh, as I said, human fMRI. Uh, this is wakefulness, sedation, anesthesia. And you can see, I uh, see uh, almost parametric decrease in the degree of global brain activity slash functional connectivity, synchronization between the different regions. So then we also did a coma patients, uh, unresponsive wakefulness state. You can see healthy control, minimally conscious state, and uh, uh, unresponsive wakefulness. state. Then we also did quite an interesting thing because it was a collaboration with a uh, pharmacologist also. So they also had some rats and put them into fMRI and we again uh, put some anesthesia, uh, sevofluran on the drug, on the, on the rat, and you can really see again here the global brain activity goes down. And this is what you also can see here, the global signal amplitude. It basically means the degree of synchronization between the different regions. Yeah. Um, and you can see in all, uh, when the level of consciousness goes down, you see also the global signal goes down. And that means you also have less spatial nestedness. So what does this mean? So this is basically a summary slide of those. You have less spatial nestedness. Yeah, here's the global, doesn't really include the former. I mean, it decreases activity. And here you have the de-differentiation of the different time scales. Uh, it's basically all time scales have the same power, remember, from the power law exponent. And then ultimately, that's the way the brain looks like in anesthesia. And that's exactly the way, assuming the common currency, the shared spatial temporal features between neuronal and mental, I would assume that's exactly the mental state or non-mental state you have when you're anesthetic or you become more and more sedated. Yeah, it's completely de-differentiated. You do not perceive any differences anymore until the perception itself also completely disappears. So now you say, yeah, this is sort of more negative because, okay, you show some neuronal data, but the link to the phenomenon is rather indirect. It's an inference. And you're absolutely right. So here I show you other example, how topography can uh, impact. Uh, let me uh, put everything on. So how... The whole brain topography, the relation, how the different regions stand in relation to each other, uh, changes your mental topography. So this is an example on meditation. A uh, paper was just very recently published. So one key feature in meditation is, uh, you know, when you come into the more progressive stages, it's that you have an experience of a non-dual experience. Uh, non-duality, you don't make a difference anymore between uh, yourself and the environment, between self and non-self. You're completely aligned and you don't, you experience yourself in, let's say, unity with the world. And I think this is very nicely uh, figured here. Usually you have your beliefs, that's a self, other self, world distinction, and that shapes all our cognitions, our emotions, uh, body, environment, the self, other distinction. And that is sort of suspended when you get into this non-dual mode. Yeah. Um, and we argue that that is related to the topographic reorganization of the brain. So I tell you here, so this is a meta-analysis of studies from 
uh, novice meditators versus proficient meditators. Uh, we did all the studies, FMI studies, uh, we could, it's mainly resting state. And what we observed, and this is quite a robust finding, that this is really a reorganization, a topographic reorganization of your brain. So usually you have this negative correlation between central executive network and default mode network, and you have different degrees of connectivity between anterior and posterior. And in the proficient meditator, that topographic organization was different. Now you had a positive relationship between the default mode network and central executive network. And this is not just for the FMI specialist, an artifact of the uh, global signal regression or not, that is real, has been found in many uh, studies. Yeah, and also what you observe, you observe a much higher degree of synchronization throughout the whole brain. So suddenly you don't have this distinction between unimodal sensory regions and transmodal higher order regions anymore, between core periphery, between prefrontal cortex, sensory regions. So they're more equally synchronized. So the brain doesn't make a principal difference anymore. So it's really a topographic reorganization, what you observe. And we assume that that topographic reorganization is also related to your experience of non-duality. Now, let me show you the next uh, slide. So in addition, we also looked we introduced a paper on the self 2020, a large scale meta-analysis where we showed three different layers of self. Uh, the interceptive self, uh, mainly interceptive regions, insula salamus, uh, the extraceptive self, mainly regions like uh, temporal parietal junction. This is all the studies by Olaf Blanke. And then the mental self, mainly cortical midline structures, default mode network. And now we looked for these regions in the meditation studies. And what we observed in the proficient meditator, that there's much more activity down here in the interceptive and extraceptive processing. So the interface with the environment was much larger in their sense of self, versus the mental self, the regions showed significantly lower activity, like the DMN, particularly the cortical midline region. So you also see that here, this is really fosters the duality. So here, I have an experience of the environment as distinct from my mental self. However, now when your mental self is much less activated and your intra-exoceptive self is much larger activated, you have a much bigger interface with the environment. And that you may say, oh, maybe I'm not that different anymore from the, from the environment. And that's exactly what you experience. The experience of non-duality, and also here I added the non-locality, uh, and that's that's uh, really and I think it's very uh, nicely. Uh, also here, the first author Austin Cooper uh, did this figures. Here you have a clear dual organization on the neuronal level and also on the mental level. Here you have a non-dual organization on the neuronal level and on the mental level. So here you see really an application of common currency. You have, I think it's in the next slide. Um, yeah, uh, you have a non-dual organization on the level of the neural activity and you have a non-dual experience of self -aware. That's what I mean by shared uh, topographic organization. And now we're working on the uh, dynamic uh, side of things. So that's really where neuronal topography translates into mental topography. This is one of the key features which the TTC really tries to foster, we need to analyze the mental states in a much more sophisticated way, in topographic terms, in dynamic terms. We now have studies where we do time series of thoughts, time series of perception, and analyze their dynamic features. There's much more information, and I think that's largely neglected. So that was the first mechanism, gave you an idea, I hope, how uh, temporal spatial nestedness, how the uh, temporal spatial nestedness is basically uh, uh, completely decreased, if not abolished, when you lose consciousness, anesthesia, sleep, etc. And if your temporal spatial nested is reorganized in a slightly different nestedness, like in meditation, you have a topographic reorganization, then also your mental topography changes slash your experience. So here you see that temporal spatial nestedness tries really to bridge the gap between the neural and mental. Now, I give you yet another example, uh, the form or structure of consciousness, what we call temple spatial align. 
your structure, you have a certain form. What do I mean by form and structure? You have a certain figure background that goes back to the Gestalt theory uh, for the visual. They described as wonderful for, for the visual domain that you really have a figure background organization. That's what I mean, for instance, by uh, um, uh, by organization. Uh, Tononi in his axioms in the IIT also tries to pick out some of these examples, as I understand them, they really go largely back to a gestalt theory without explicitly mentioning so. So I think that's what I mean by form and structure of consciousness, and I will give you some example. This is here again uh, uh, in the a table from the 2017 paper. So let me show uh, the, what do I mean by alignment. So the typical example of alignment is when you listen to a music piece uh, and you unconsciously tap your uh, uh, foot into the rhythm of the music. And this is basically a dynamic autopilot. And important, that tapping gives you a feeling groove, you feel great, and wow, let's go on, or the surface completely in sync with the wave, and wow, this gives you a great feeling. And that's important. Here you see you're sort of aligned, entrainment is one particular mechanism of alignment. Um, yeah, uh, is one, and that right uh, strongly shapes your experience. So this is important. So here I show you another example of what alignment. So alignment, temporal special alignment itself includes a variety of different possible mechanisms for the alignment. So my hope is that maybe some people are interested in the TTC, pick it up and say, okay, not of this temporal special alignment is at best an umbrella term and you need to subsume 20 different mechanisms on it. Great. But these 20 different mechanisms might then also be associated with slightly distinct phenomenal differences, fine-grained phenomenal differences. So let me give you here what we call the uh, task periodicity. So this was done by, by uh, Philip Klar. And so he, we had a data set here where we had a very long, in, so we had single self and non-self stimuli through second fMRI study. And we had very long intertrial intervals, 50 to 60 seconds. So two second stimulus, 50 to second, uh, 50 to 60 second intertrial interval, two second stimulus, and so forth. So and then you can measure, basically measure the uh, task, uh, uh, whether your brain follows the frequency of the task, the task periodicity, as it is called. So here, upper left, fMI, you see the resting state. Uh, we distinguish between the core, transmodal core regions, uh, prefrontal cortex, other higher order regions versus periphery regions. Uh, uh, sensory and motor cortices. And you could see uh, here, we again, we did the uh, power law exponent, remember the relationship between the power and the slower and faster frequencies. And we can see as expected, uh, this typical uh, shape of the curve, each line upper left uh, is uh, one subject and you see it's quite homogeneous and you see the uh, power spectra follows a typical scale free description. So now you go to the middle, there you see uh, now the task. So now it's no longer resting state as upper left. Now we're in the task where they presented the stimuli after 50 to 60 seconds. And that's, and then you see the blue bar in the curve. So that's exactly the frequency range of the task because you can recalculate the 50, 60 seconds into the frequency domain and then look whether the brain in that same frequency domain shows uh, increase in its power. And that's exactly what you see. You see here uh, in the blue sky, particular very increase in the power, particular in the uh, frequency of the task. And you see this for both core and periphery. And even more interesting now, transiently the topography of core versus periphery, which was still distinguished, core had higher PLE, periphery had lower PLE, was completely abolished during the task. Yeah, there was no distinction anymore between core and periphery because both followed the, um, the, the frequency range of the task. So your brain follows the task periodicity. And I'm sure when you listen to me, your brain, if I do this for longer here, you see, I don't know whether you see me, you see my hand, now I'm trying to do a rhythmic movement. I'm sure, I hope at least in some of you, your brain will align and your intertrial phase coherence, another measure will follow. And if I do this for the next hour, which I will not, you will see a similar power spectrum. So we could measure that. So, and 
So what you can see, and that's really, so what you see first, you see that your uh, brain activity follows the frequency of the task. Yeah, and the scale-free, just for the experts among you, the scale-free nature was preserved because we calculated fractal and oscillatory component. And we saw uh, also that the core periphery, the topography was transiently abolished during the task because for the brain, it was more important to follow the task periodicity. That's the awake state. Now I show you the same thing in a different paradigm. It's slightly faster. Uh, here we presented the stimuli every 20, 25 seconds, and we did this in uh, awake state, sedated state, anesthetic state. So, and what you can see here, uh, you see here is uh, here is again the, the frequency of the task. So this was slightly faster now, 20 to the, uh, 15 to 20 seconds. But you again see in the awake state that the brain really follows the periodicity of the task. And also the core periphery was again abolished. So this is a replication in the awake state. But now see what happens in the sedated state. They don't really follow anymore. Uh, the task, to certain degrees, has a large intersubject variability. But now this is the important thing here. Look at this one. Is completely flat. So in the anesthetic state, your brain does not follow the task periodicity anymore. So uh, flat, there's no way that you can adapt. So meaning there's no temple alignment anymore, no task periodicity. So then down here, I show you, now you say, okay, this is a special cognitive phenomenon, special cognitive resources. No, 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 no. It's a purely dynamic phenomenon. This is what we simulated here. This is a simulation. This is a large-scale model, uh, the Chaudhuri model, large-scale model. And we just simulated a different uh, sets of uh, um, uh, system to different PE values. And we stimulate, so the same PE value, and we stimulated the system with different kind of sine waves, uh, slower, faster, even faster. And what you see, the PLE adapts. So this is a purely dynamic phenomenon which your brain does when it's exposed to certain frequencies. So uh, this is a nice, uh, very nice figure. Philip uh, Clark did this, and I always like this. So you remember the scale-free activity, uh, strong power in slower frequencies, less power in faster frequency, uh, is also described as pink noise. So this is very important. We have rest in the pink noise, we have temple spatial nestedness, and that makes it possible for you then also to change the frequency and align to the task. So temple spatial nestedness is a necessary condition for temple spatial alignment. And you also see the topography. Now, when you lose consciousness, you lose your nestedness. Basically, your PLE is flat. Remember the completely flat curves. These are real data again that replicates the earlier curve I showed you, completely flat power spectrum. I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw that first time five, six years ago. And so this is a replication of that. And then the brain cannot align. There's no task, uh, task periodicity anymore. Why? Because it's pure white noise. So you see here, this is pink noise and this is white noise. That's why he sketched it like that. So that really suggests, I think that strongly supports that this temple spatial nestedness is a necessary non-sufficient condition of possible consciousness. And it also uh, precedes the uh, alignment if, because if you don't have nestedness, you cannot align. Of course, the causal relation here needs to be, this is a, a very a tentative interpretation. We need to show this in more detail. But the main thing I want to show you, loss of st spatial temporal alignment, loss of uh, consciousness. So, of course, as I already indicated, uh, uh, temporal spatial alignment is an umbrella term, which probably includes different mechanisms, in particular different time scales. So this beautiful figure, again, comes from Philip, is fantastically good in visualizing, much better than I, I, will, I ever will be. Uh, so basically, here, this is a temporal spatial alignment, and there's really support as I said, I cannot go into detail. Uh, you have sort of a very low frequency, longer time scale on which alignment happens, like the task periodicity. You have sort of intermediate time scales, and you have also frequency lower time scales, like when you uh, synchronize or align to the rhythm of my hand, for instance, or to music. So again, the alignment itself. And also here, he makes a link to the phenomenal dimension. If you have longer time scales, 
and you align to longer time scale, your perception is very different. Uh, you have different aspects of the picture. If you have a uh, midterm time scale or very short time scale, you perceive different things. So each time scale, I cannot show this in detail, uh, is related to a certain time scale in the environment. And then you put your, uh, put the whole thing together. You see there's a certain organization structure of consciousness also on the mental level in terms of more stable background, more flexible, more changing foreground. So uh, that is important. So what is the mechanism of this alignment? We assume that there's a stochastic matching of the time scales from the environment with the time scales of the brain. And the better you match, the better you align, and the more likely you're conscious. Remember, the better you synchronize with the music or synchronize with the wave, the better your feeling of the groove doing surfing or of the music. Yeah, and that's, uh, uh, I think, very important. And that is also relevant for other species. So this is a schematic figure where we showed that different species, like cats, monkeys, humans, have different types of time scales. So your time scales of your brain, short, long, intermediate, are your interface with the environment. And that's key for consciousness. Here, I show you an example, which we simulated uh, in the robot. So the current AI, artificial intelligence and robot, as I understand, I'm not an expert expert here, but they really have a limited number of time scales. One thing of the brain, it has an abundance of time scales. And that makes you flexible. It's unbelievable. Yeah, that I think the current AI is limited. That's why it's not as adaptive. Yeah, so here, and it's well known in the brain that you have sort of a layers of time scales following the core periphery or transmodal, unimodal, unimodal, shorter time scales, shorter temporal windows, uh, the transmodal uh, cortical midline structures, DMN, longer time scales. You see this here. Now, if you, for instance, build into your robot, so you play music, as you know, music has multiple time scales. Uh, um, yeah. And so now, if you build into your robot only the slow time scales, uh, sorry, only the fast time scales, the short time scales, your robot will dance too fast to the music. Now, if you build into your robot, only slow time scales, long time, but not the fast one, your robot will always dance too slow. And the sad but truth, that's exactly what you see in depression, a severe depression, where the people come to me as a psychiatrist, that in depression, your brain is too slow, the people experience abnormal slowness, and they're always laggy behind, literally. And of course, that's frustrating. So now, if you have an abundance of different time scales, yeah, then it makes it more likely, most likely, that you can quite well adapt uh, and dance to the rhythm of the music. So that tells you that's basically temple spatial alignment. So I hope I gave an indication of that. Of course, as you already saw, there's still a lot of work missing, but it's a first step. In particular, we need the neural phenomenon uh, kind of thing. Now, last mechanism, I will keep that relatively short, not to stretch the time too much, the content of consciousness. So uh, that is really, as I understand, most of the theories of consciousness really focus on the content of consciousness. Yeah, or as I understand, they don't really make a distinction between different mechanisms for level state and content of consciousness, let alone introducing the structure of form consciousness. And that I think is really a key feature of the TTC, but of course, one always has a bias for his own theory. So um, here, what we can, this is a paper which we wrote last year, we're comparing the importance of timescales. And when you look into the IIT, it has very short time scales, uh, max 100 to uh, 300 milliseconds. However, your consciousness, that may be the actual contents of your consciousness. So let's say when you perceive me now, you're doing this, that's your consciousness, that's where your 100, 300 millisecond time scale is perfect if you want to follow this one. However, that you perceive this one against your background, yeah, against a more stable background. And even more important, if your background is different, this gesture might have different meanings. I will illustrate that. So meaning, the, it's not just a single time scale, it's the different time scales and you see this already, how they are nested within each other. 
So what I mean is very important. Temporal spatial expansion is about the single content of consciousness, the mechanism, how the sing how the content, a single particular content of consciousness is generated. And we say that's the time scale of the content itself, but integrated within various other time scales. Let me illustrate that. Um, one thing which is often neglected in uh, 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 current series of consciousness, there's one paper by the Global Neuronal, I think 2006, uh, about pre-stimulus activity. Um, there is the, obviously the predictive approach takes into account the pre-stimulus activity through the empirical prior, but not explicitly. So, um, so for the TTC, this is a key mechanism. So how is it possible that you experience a particular content as part of your ongoing stream of consciousness? So I take the notion of the stream of consciousness by William James extremely seriously, because literally, how is that possible? So the question is, the external input must somehow interact with the ongoing spontaneous activity. And as you know, pre-stimulus activity prior to the zero of the input, that's what you call pre-stimulus and post-stimulus. And that interaction is an important, is non-linear or non-additive. So it's not that the external input activity is just uh, put on top of the ongoing activity. That would be linear supervision indicated here. So the stimulus uh, induces some activity, which is just basically put on top of the ongoing. This is the ongoing activity, and the stimulus just put on top of it. So there's no real interaction between the ongoing or pre-stimulus activity and the external input. Now, however, the data do not support such a linear superposition. What the data support that is a non-additive interaction. That means that the resulting activity slash the event-related or evoked activity or task-related activity, the magnitude or the amplitude of that, is not just the sum of the stimulus itself and the ongoing activity. It is either smaller or larger. That's what we call as a negative interaction or positive interaction. And if the resulting activity, the event-related potential, the amplitude, uh, is either smaller or uh, uh, a larger than the sum uh, of both independently, and you can calculate that. I cannot go into detail. Uh, I can uh, refer to all these papers here. Uh, then there must be some kind of non-linear interaction between the extrinsic input and the ongoing. So why do I say that? This is uh, this model. As I said, we have various papers. I cannot go into detail for that. So this non-additive interaction. So what exactly happens here? The idea is that the external input may suppress the ongoing activity to a certain degree, and that means it suppresses the internal ongoing mental content in order to make literally room for the external content. So here, so for instance, there's clear uh, findings show that pre-stimulus dynamics high or low has a differential impact on the post-stimulus. Uh, amplitude and what you actually perceive. There is, for instance, very fascinating findings in pre-stimulus power, pre-stimulus alpha power, a variety of findings, quite robust, that the pre-stimulus alpha power, particular low level, are very linked to the particular the subjective features of your percept in the post-stimulus state. So that means the non-additive interaction between the pre-stimulus and the post-stimulus activity is key for your contents of consciousness, for the single content of consciousness. And what does that mean? It means that the time scale of the external input itself is embedded within the longer time scales of the ongoing activity. Let me show you this picture. So this is from the uh, IIT versus TTC paper. Um, you can see here you have a bang. Okay, here external input uh, bang. Uh, this is what we uh, try here for the IIT. And we say what IIT calls integration of information. And I think it's a key point. It's a very good concept. And this is basically when he speaks of integration of information, it's a non-additive integration. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, 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 Natsu uh, uh, Tutti, uh, he has a beautiful explanation of this integration of information, some nice figures, uh, Tutti uh, from uh, Monash. Um, it's a very nice illustration. It's basically the sum is more 
uh, the, the whole is more than the sum of its part. You know, that's the motto of Tononi, and of course that goes back to the Gestalt theory. Uh, and that's exactly what you see here. And we say that that integration information due to temporal integration. So temporal integration of your single input and its time scales into different kinds of uh, time scales. So we uh, uh, discussed the concept of temporal integration segregation in another paper here recently in, 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 in TICS. And so this is uh, very key. So now meaning that the bang, that single signal is integrated within the, on, the longer time scales of the ongoing activity. Now, if before the bang, I had the idea, okay, there's a track and field. I was thinking, I was mind wandering about a track and field and a stadium. And of course, what do you do in track and field? You run and you start and there's a pistol. Okay, then you perceive, you associate that with the bang because here you don't see. It. Now, however, if you uh, thought about a forest and then you hear bang, okay, you said maybe somebody should a deer. So meaning, your bang is integrated within the longer ongoing time scales and then accordingly set into the context. So this is really is your figure background uh, perception is very important. And I think a, a big problem is that many of the time uh, of the uh, series of content do not consider these different time scales and they also don't consider the interaction between pre and post stimulus interaction. There are some very nice papers now by the uh, group around uh, BUH, which showed that the pre-stimulus pre prediction, uh, and that of course the predictive approach, has a strong impact on the um, uh, uh, content of your visual perception. So that means, and I think that's where I see, I will come back to that later, you see really a convergence between the predictive coding approach and the dynamic approach. Yeah. So we call, um, so, <clears throat> Let me uh, illustrate another neurophenomenal example. This is passed uh, based on data here on the autocorrelation window, the time scales, as well as uh, the phenomenal feature, the sort of an, uh, inference schematically. So what we observed, you can measure the, remember initially I said the autocorrelation window, the time scales. And so when you have a variety of different time scales, you can really perceive the whole. Here, this is uh, this. Uh, figure was done by Federico Sirio in, in, in Italy, and I always love this. So here you have a police guy, you have a, a thief, and they follow and they pick police stop, stop right now, and you see you need different time scales. You need a long time scale to link the two. Uh, you need shorter time scale to pick up each word, and you need me medium time scale sort of to make uh, the connection between the two. Now, if during sleep, and that's real data, Federico so, uh, showed that in a paper in uh, 2021 in NeuroImage, uh, now, when your sort of your shorter time scales slightly disappear, suddenly you cannot see the fine grained details anymore, meaning you have a, a gradual de differentiation and it becomes a little bit more blurry and coarse. Now, if your time scales, like in N2, become even longer and your shorter time scales disappear, your temporal resolution of your perception is much less meaning it becomes more and more blurry. And finally, in anesthesia, you have only long time scales and no shorter anymore. So, and that's, as I said, it's based on real EEG data, your perception is completely blurry, meaning you have a consecutive de-differentiation. That I think is really important when you lose consciousness. So, conclusion. Um, this is uh, come to the TTC. One criterion, I think, for every theory of consciousness should be that it can explain and differentiate different kinds of conscious states, including psychedelics. Of course, the entropy hypothesis can do this perfectly. Uh, different states of sleep, uh, lucid dreams, for instance, schizophrenia, anesthesia, dreams. And as you see, we <clears throat> try to now apply the TTC framework, <clears throat> the common currency idea, the spatial temporal framework to different kinds of mental features. So you saw this meditation paper on the topographic uh, uh, reorganization model of meditation. We just published a paper on the uh, topographic uh, dynamic reorganization model of dreams, where we really make the neurophenomenal link 
based on topography dynamic slash spatial temple features. And as some of you might know, we work a lot also on mental disorders, schizophrenia, anxiety, because after all, I'm also a psychiatrist. So I think this is a key point, an interesting question. So here you see the three different mechanisms plotted, the main temple spatial expansion, nestedness, and alignment, how they allow to differentiate these different conditions. And of course, in the future, it would be interesting what robots uh, can do. Yeah. <clears throat> and so, uh, coming almost uh, to the end, how can we, uh, what are unique features of the TTC? I think it's really a global rather than a local uh, approach to the brain, topography and dynamic. Uh, the second is the brain body environment. So the same alignment mechanism also go obviously for the body, but they're really key. So it's an explicitly, and that's very important for me, neuroecological theory. It's not just a neuro, uh, neuronal theory. Uh, second important, uh, we consider both rest, spontaneous activity and task, and that interaction is key for the context of consciousness. So that's the third point here, intrinsic relation of inner rest and outer rest tasks in conscious states. Then another key feature and I'll show this, consciousness is not, con uh, is not cognition. So consciousness is experience. And when I mean here, experience is mainly the phenomenal features. So for me, cognition is secondary. I will show that in the next slide. And then also important, we have the variety of different mechanisms rather than just one mechanism, one size fits all. So um, you see here uh, what we see in, in that uh, 2020 paper, we discussed the concept of spatial temple neuroscience, which is really important to see the brain dynamics and how brain dynamics shapes brain function. We have a lot of studies now where we really look, let's say we look for attention, working memory, and we look how the temple features shape the brain dynamic, shape the cognitive function. So it's not an exclusive, it's not parallel, but there's a shaping. So that's why I also build a hierarchy. So I would say phenomenal consciousness is here. Uh, it's really experience and not just one phenomenal features like qualia, but also intentionality, obscenity, and all these other phenomenal features so beautifully discussed in phenomenological philosophy. I think they need to be brought into the discussion. And then you see the different kinds of consciousness, what I included more up here, uh, access <coughs> consciousness. Now, <clears throat> here, this is, I call this, uh, oh, is it a way? No, the tree of uh, consciousness series. I don't know whether you can reach this, uh, the stupid thing. Okay. Um, so the tree of consciousness series that I try to give a little bit of hierarchy here. So I would consider here very close the temple spatial theory of consciousness, the operation of space time by the finger quotes brothers, entropy hypothesis. I think I would locate them here. Then I would locate here the predictive approaches, integrated information up here, embodied approach, and obviously closely to sensory motor functions. And then the upper ones here, probably a little coarse-grained, I hope people uh, are me. So I do not say that these theories are wrong. Don't misunderstand me. I say that these theories uh, highlight specific aspects of consciousness, but I think they need to be put into a broader framework to show this. And that's why I, at least tentatively, of course, you know my guess, it's a spatial temporal framework. Um, yeah, I forgot here, of course, the mental features. Okay, so Freudian slip. And so with that, I'm coming to the end. I hope I uh, uh, could sort of inspire some people, not convince people, but inspire some people that maybe this is an um, interesting approach. And I mainly focus here as a dynamic, as a neural wave, which will come out in May as a book for broader audience. It has strong philosophical ontological implications, which I sketched in the Spontaneous Brain 2018, where I basically say, the problem of mind is basically a world brain problem. Remember this neuroecological dimension, the alignment is key, but that goes into ontological issues, uh, which I leave aside. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Georg.